Well, good morning. Welcome to Smoky Hill Vineyard. If, if you're new or visiting today, maybe your mom dragged you here. It does happen. Uh, my name is Noel. I'm the worship pastor here, and I'd just like to meet you after service if you have a minute to stick around. Big thanks to Amelia from New Covenant in Larksburg, who is our guest worship leader today. Really grateful for her. This weekend celebrates Mother's Day. And I'd like to say a few things about that right away. It's really wonderful that our culture has come up with these special days to honor mothers and fathers. Honoring God um, is a way that we, honoring our parents is a way that we can honor God. That's biblical. Um, I'm still trying to convince my kids that pedicures and plants are actually commanded in scripture, but I have not been successful with that yet. Um, but as, as wonderful as Mother's Day is, I'm, I'm aware, and Amelia mentioned this too, it can really be a challenging day for a lot of people. I know there's couples here in this room that would love to celebrate mothers today, but you've been struggling with infertility. Uh, there are some of us, like my husband and I, who have suffered miscarriage and, and loss in that way. There are women who would love to be married and start a family, but are single or who have um, gone through the pain of divorce. There are those of us who have had children already go on to Jesus. And some of us today are just separated from mothers and grandmothers and children, either by distance or by death or through strained relationships. So we hold these tensions as we do as followers of Jesus. It's a day of celebration and joy. And I hope that all you mamas and grandmas out there do get loved on really well today. But we also hold this, this place of tenderness and longing and even grief. You know, the beautiful thing about our God is that he knows exactly where we're at. He knows those tensions that we hold together and he sees each one of us. He knows you, he knows your name, he knows your story, and he loves you today. So I believe that God has something for each one of us here in the room and online, whether or not you're a mother. We've been in this series the last few weeks called A Seat at the Table. I think it's been a great series so far, and we've been exploring what it means to be invited and welcomed to the table of God, the family of God, and then what it might look like for us to become inviters, to be welcoming. And today we're gonna talk about that family table and how to maybe think about having a bigger family. So would you just take a moment to pray with me as we kick off together. So Lord, we thank you for your presence here. We do ask a really distinct blessing today, Jesus, on mothers of all kinds. And we ask a special comfort today for those who are, are missing, uh, those who are not with us, either children or mothers, grandmothers, and those who long to be. Lord, would you uh, bring comfort and bring hope to the places where we need it and, and celebrate in our joy with us. Bring your word to life today. I pray that every person interacting with this uh, sermon, God, would hear your voice particularly for them. Amen. Amen. So when we think of growing a family, I think we usually have two channels to do that. We think about growing through marriage, right? Every time someone marries into a family, our family gets a little bit bigger. And the other way is by having children. And those are both amazing ways to grow a family, uh, but they're maybe not the only ways. And I, I want us to explore today outside of that particular box. So we know that marriage and having children are opportunities to have a bigger family, but let's think and explore how God thinks about family and what if he thinks differently than us? We often limit it to biological and nuclear families, but what if we're invited into something bigger than the family we're born into or married into? Today, um, not that I'm ever super formal, but today's gonna be especially informal. I just wanna tell you a few stories. Some of these are stories from my life, and my hope is that as I tell you some stories from my life, that something sparks in you, that maybe some memories come back from people and situations in your own life, and maybe God would speak to you particular through, through these stories. So imagine me as a teenager. I'm short, 
and blonde. Wait a minute, that's exactly the same as I am now. Yeah, anyway, I am not that much different, a little more wrinkles, but I think I was a fairly normal teenager in all of the best ways and all of the hardest ways. Um, I was blessed enough to have loving parents who cared a lot about me. I got good grades and I was involved in music and theater and had some really good friends. But like most teenagers that I know then and now, there were things in my life that were really hard and confusing. Dating and body image, lots of pressure about competition or figuring out my future, um, what it looked like to have my own relationship with God and not just be dependent on the faith of my parents. I struggled with an eating disorder in high school and I, I also saw friends and, and classmates who wrestled with all sorts of addictions. Um, this was in the mid 90s. I remember I had a classmate who was a hemophiliac. He was one of the first teenagers who um, was a public figure with AIDS. He contracted it through a blood transfusion and every year we had a big walk to raise money because at that time there was no no cure, no, really no hope at that time. There were all sorts of things going on, uh, teen pregnancy, relationship drama, and enter into this chaotic and wonderful world of being a teenager, Toby and Bridget. Toby and Bridget were two middle-aged women who helped with our church youth group. Now, I say this with all affection and all respect, but Toby and Bridget were not cool. So sometimes you see um, youth pastors and youth leaders and you're like, oh, you look like you're 20 and they're 45 and they're always on Instagram and they've got great selfies and they know all the lingo and all the stuff. This was not Toby and Bridget. They wore mom jeans before mom jeans were back in style. Um, they weren't anything other than who they were. They didn't try to act like teenagers. They didn't try to talk like teenagers. They just loved us and they loved Jesus. One was married with kids, one was single, and they just brought who they were week in and week out to this random group of teenagers that made up our youth group. Now, I didn't need a mom. I already had a great mom, but I absolutely needed Toby and Bridget in my life at that time. They listened to me, they asked hard questions that challenged me. They said things to me that I just wasn't able to hear from my parents at that time in my life. They encouraged me. They made a place for me to use music in the church instead of just in competition at school. They laughed with me and absolutely were just a safe place for me to belong. I don't remember any like dramatic supernatural conversations that we had that shaped my whole life. They were just steady, normal, middle-aged ladies who made me feel like I belonged. And you know, if I could feel like I belonged as a teenager, then it opened up the possibility that maybe God had a place and a plan for me to belong with him and in community for the rest of my life. Toby and Bridget didn't have perfect lives, they weren't super Christians, but they loved us well, and I know that there's a group of us, because we're still connected, in our 40s, spread all around the country, who know God and have a different kind of confidence that we belong to the family of God because they treated us like family. Maybe you've had a Toby or a Bridget in your life. Someone along the way who made a place for you, who welcomed you in, even when your life was messy and dramatic, maybe they saw the best in you when you really couldn't see much good. They reminded you that Jesus loved you when you didn't feel very lovable. They had faith for you when mostly you had doubt. Maybe you've been a Toby or a Bridget. Maybe you've taken that opportunity to be a safe place for kids or young adults or students or colleagues. Maybe you've been a family that's been intentional with including your single friends in your holiday meals and your everyday meals. You might not have been a mother to someone, but you've welcomed them in as you would family. That's our first story. Does that bring anything to mind? Is there someone that's popping up in your memory that has been a Toby or a Bridget for you? 
Is there maybe someone that you think, ah, maybe I could be that kind of person in their life? All right, our next story is about a woman who married a refugee who had moved to her country because his own uh, country had a, a horrible famine. He moved with his parents and his brother. And this woman married her husband. They were married for about 10 years. And sadly, they were not able to have children. And then, tragically, her husband died, her brother-in-law died, her father-in-law had already died, so all that's left are three widows. And their mother-in-law decides, after all this tragedy, she's lost her husband and both of her sons, she's just gonna take the risks and go back to her home country and see if she can find community there. So she says goodbye to her two daughters-in-law, and she heads out. And she doesn't get very far before she's chased down by one of her daughters-in-law. And the mother-in-law tries to convince her, just go back, go back to your people, you'll be more comfortable there, you'll be safer, you'll be happy, you can get married again. I'm alone, I'm the one that doesn't have anybody, but you don't have to be alone like me. But her daughter-in-law, Ruth, refuses to leave her. So let's pick this up in Ruth 1.16. Ruth, the daughter-in-law, says, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts me from you. Maybe you remember this story. It's in the Old Testament, um, sometimes called the First Testament, and it's really this beautiful story of a family forming through tragedy and loss and kindness and welcome. We can't go through the whole plot today, but um, I'd encourage you to take some time. If it's been a while since you've read the book of Ruth, take this week and just read it. It's a very short story, but it's full of the beauty of how God um, works all things to good, where he takes um, all things that are painful and when we follow him, he knits a beautiful uh, picture that uh, we could never do ourselves. And it shows us what it means to be family. You know, Ruth could have stayed with what was comfortable for her, her own family, in that culture, uh, much like around the world today, extended family was everything. You didn't just have your nuclear family, you had your whole family, aunts and uncles and cousins and third cousins and um, people who you just adopted in as family. But she was willing to um, face the discomfort of leaving her extended family, her own culture, her own language, her own country. And instead, she sees Naomi in this time of need, in her aloneness, and chooses to be the truest kind of family to her. You know, these two widows arrive back in Israel and they're what an extremely um, educated theologians call a pickle. That's a joke, you guys can laugh. That's the Greek, no, I'm just kidding. We'll leave the Greek to Mike. Um, in a patriarchal society, they didn't really have much way to provide for themselves. They were very dependent on men to provide for them. They're at the mercy of others' generosity. So Ruth knows that she needs to care for her mother-in-law, so she heads out to the fields and thinks maybe those harvesting the fields will just leave a little bit of food behind, enough for us to not starve. And in doing so, she jumps in, bumps into our, our third hero of the story, Boaz. If any of you ladies are pregnant out there, Boaz, probably not on the top 10 list. It's only four letters, be easy to spell in kindergarten. I think we need more Boaz's. Now, Boaz, I think, is really similar to Ruth. Um, he has an eye for those on the outside, maybe those who need help. And he also knows God's ways, so he's very familiar with the laws God set up to look out for the poor, to look out for the immigrant and the refugee and for the widow. So he doesn't harvest everything he could. You know, in our society, our goal is to make the most profit, to wring the most money out of whatever product we have to sell. But that was not God's way. So Boaz, instead of um, harvesting every ounce of grain, he would leave behind, leave places untouched, so that the poor coming behind his harvesters would have a chance to bring in their own food. 
uh, that those laws are in several places, but in Leviticus 19 as well. Ruth gets the, the benefit of this generosity, but Boaz goes even farther with her. He literally invites her to his table. He makes a place of protection so that she could belong to his group of workers. He knows that she's vulnerable as a single woman. He gives her extra food to take home to Naomi. And, and spoiler alert, if you haven't read this story, Boaz and Ruth end up getting married. And this poor, widowed, immigrant woman who's kind and generous and has committed to being family until death for her mother-in-law, she finds true love with this equally kind and generous man who chooses family outside of his social status, outside of his own culture. And second spoiler alert, Ruth is able to have a child. This child grows up to be part of the lineage that leads all the way to Jesus. There's so much in this story about growing a family, but I just wanna focus in on a few highlights. You know, sometimes a bigger family means letting go of what makes us comfortable. Sometimes a bigger family means we choose to stay when it's hard. And sometimes a bigger family means extraordinary generosity. Does this story bring up anything for you? Do you see any ways where this might apply to your own life? You know, maybe you have a great family, a big family or a small family, but lots of connection. Maybe you don't really feel that need for more community or more relationship. What might God be inviting you to share out of generosity? If you have a great family, what would it look like to make it bigger? to invite people in who don't yet have a place to belong, who don't have that same support system. And maybe like Boaz, you have an eye to see who's vulnerable, who might be struggling right now. You know, we're starting to see a little bit of hope that there's another side, there's an other side to this pandemic. But this last year has left a lot of us lonely, looking for community, recognizing maybe the holes in our life where we thought we had lots of relationship, uh, but we've seen a reality that maybe we hadn't built up relationship like we thought. Maybe you could be a Boaz. You could be the person to step out of your comfort zone and really commit to the good of someone else. You know, what would that look like practically in your life? Maybe it's just hosting backyard cookouts for some of your neighbors who may not be connected. You know, Denver and Aurora are cities full of transient people. There's people moving all the time. So chances are a lot of your neighbors don't actually know anyone. Chances are a lot of them don't have family here. What would it look like to be a place of welcome? What would it look like if you have family traditions and gatherings to have an eye for someone who might not have family here, to invite them in? And then what does it look like to stick with people and relationships uh, that are challenging, that need God's radical kind of love and not just where we grit it out, but where we're filled with the power of God to love well? Okay, last story. Back when I was in high school, you remember Toby and Bridget, I had uh, an encounter with God and a, a prophetic word was spoken over me. Uh, this word was that I would be a trench, uh, think World War I or World War II, a, a war trench, a place of safety for the orphan. Now as a teenager, I immediately went to the most grandiose version of this that I could think of, which was that I would open orphanages all around the world and save thousands of children and adopt tons of children too. Now none of that happened, but that word really stayed with me and it planted this desire um, and calling really to adopt. Um, fast forward to my late 20s and my husband Will and I had been married for a little while and had started growing our family. We had two beautiful little ones, Jude and Joella. We had gone through a painful miscarriage and this idea and thought of adoption was, hadn't gone away. 
Uh, we were involved in a missions group that was really teaching us about what it looked like to follow Jesus around the world. It was opening our eyes to a lot of need around the world, both how to support local pastors in their home countries, but also um, how we might be involved. God was breaking our heart in the best ways. And I remember going to um, a church service uh, at the time we were part of Vineyard Columbus and I was leading uh, worship at a Saturday night service. Uh, Will stayed home with our little ones and our, our pastor, Rich Nathan, gave this whole sermon which had nothing to do with adoption. It was all about the depravity of man, not a cheery sermon. But he gave this list of statistics of all of the awful things that we do to each other. Trafficking and just list after list of awful things. And I was just weeping in this service as God continued to break my heart. I brought a Kleenex. <laughs> I knew this would happen. Um, but in this moment, I felt the Lord speak to me as I became overwhelmed by the magnitude of loss and grief and need around the world. And my prayer was something like, God, it's overwhelming. What, what can I do? It's too much. And I felt the Lord pretty clearly say, I, I have one for you. And so I went home really excited and Will was, you know, with our little ones. I'm like, this is it. We're supposed to adopt right now. And, you know, gave my grand announcement. And not surprisingly, that's not the greatest way to communicate huge life decisions. So um, Will needed to have his own process. Uh, so I, I actually went, not that this was the first time we talked about it, but you know, it, we weren't quite at go just because I said so. Um, so I went the next day and um, led worship and took our kids out to an art show. And when I came home that night, Will had had a really profound encounter with the Lord. And um, my husband is someone who, loves scripture and spends a lot of time in scripture and and throughout that day the Lord had been bringing scriptures to mind about adoption and how we are all adopted when we follow Jesus none of us are born into faith none of us are born a Christian there's a an old singer who died a long time ago named Keith Green and he said going to church doesn't make you a Christian even any more than um, going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger Right, like just being here in the room doesn't make you a Christian, just being born to, to Christian parents doesn't make you a believer. We all choose and we are all chosen. God adopts each one of us into his family. So Will had this, this moment and moments with the Lord that, that really turned his heart in the same way that mine had been turned the night before. I will say in our marriage, it doesn't usually happen that quickly, but um, within you know a couple days, the Lord had really cemented this call to adoption. And through lots and lots of um, really profound things, our hearts settled on Ethiopia. And uh, within about six months, we were matched with this beautiful little boy, Jordan Bontegiza. And uh, within the next nine months, we were able to bring him home as a, a six-month-old little boy. And I went to Ethiopia to bring him home and, you know, we'd been waiting and waiting, lots of dramatic stories in there. If you're interested, I can share some time. But uh, I remember holding him. I was literally all alone in this city, um, knew no one was in an, a, an apartment, Airbnb before Airbnb existed, holding this little boy. Will was at home in Ohio with our other little ones. And um, just really questioning before the Lord, was it right to take Jordan out of his home culture. He had already experienced so much loss. This idea of transracial adoption, we had you know, learned a lot and read a lot and heard a lot, but it still isn't real till it's real. So I'm asking the Lord all these questions. Is this the right thing? Is this the right thing for Jordan to take him out of this? He has no choice in the matter. He's a six month old baby. And I felt the Lord really clearly say to me again, this was my idea, not yours. And in that moment, it doesn't make anything easy, right? The struggles that were still there and the questions that were still there and the life that Jordan um, has to lead as a black young man in a white family, those are all still real challenges. He's had his losses, he's had his gains and so have the rest of us. But in that moment, hearing from the Lord, 
that his calling was for us, that it was his idea, not something we invented, brought the freedom and joy to continue to move forward. Um, you know, there's a, a Psalm 68 that says, God sets the lonely or places the lonely in families. And for us and our family, you know, that's what adoption looked like for us. And it wasn't just Jordan that needed a family. It was the other four of us that needed Jordan. There was a loneliness in each of us that God, I think, had allowed until he put us all together. Uh, there was a healing that came for all five of us when he brought us together as a family. You know, in this church, I know that there are, are people who are fostering kiddos right now. There are people who have adopted. I have two friends just in the last few weeks who brought a baby home at birth. Another family brought a 12-year-old home just in the last few weeks. Families are formed in all of these beautiful and creative ways. And... Um, I wonder for you, you know, adoption is a really specific call to parenting. It's not rescuing a child. It's not a fix for loneliness. It's a particular call to parenting. And I wonder if some of you today might have had that stirring in your life. Maybe it's to foster um, and, and, uh, or provide respite for foster families. There's a lot of ways that God can break our heart in the best ways to grow our families and to be a place of safety and belonging. You know, we're all called to be family and God has a lot to say about becoming a bigger family. Like I said before, we're not born into it, we are adopted into it. In Romans 8, it says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Does that describe you? Are you led by the Spirit of God? And if so, we are all the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, or Papa, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. You know, we have all been adopted into a bigger family. If you are a follower of Jesus right now, then we are related through God's love for us. You know, in this world, adoption only is possible through loss, through tragedy. That's the reality of every adoption story is that it's only possible because of something painful. But adoption brings, it's meant to bring healing and connection and belonging out of that place of loss. And I think the same for us, you know, the way that we have lived our lives against Jesus is a place of brokenness and loss, place of pain. When we choose against him, that's what comes out of our lives and it's obviously what we see in the world all around us in every way, lots of pain. But God comes in out of his great love and says, no, you belong to me. That loneliness that you have, I will set you in my family and you will belong for eternity. And you will not just be my only child, you will belong to this gargantuous family around the world made of every tribe and every language, every culture and every tradition, every age, every background. It's gonna be a beautiful family. And we're bound together by being chosen uh, by the Lord himself. We're gonna end our time together by, by joining at the table that we are all invited to, the, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. And I think about um, Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, looking around at these 12 disciples of his. Um, there are a couple brothers in the mix, right? A couple biological family members, but mostly this was a really random group of guys. They had all been adopted in. They had all been invited 
If you don't have communion elements, if you're at home, go ahead and grab those. If you're here in the room, there's um, baskets by each of the crosses if you would like to grab some, and I think there might be some in the back as well. Thank you again for joining us live and through SHV at Home today. Especially if this was your first time visiting, we're so thankful to have you be a part of our community. What comes next for each of you? If you aren't sure where to start, download the SHV app, and if you're here in the room, come on back to the Connect table and talk with Joan, our community life pastor. And we'd love to see you next week, either in person or online. Ladies, don't forget to pick up your gift on the way out. We hope that you all have a wonderful day. God bless. God bless.